Okay, everyone, places and action. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. You talking to me? Here looks like you boys have seen a lot of action. You're going to need a bigger boat. Why so serious? I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. This is a Cinema Plus podcast brought to you by More Movies. You're listening to the Cinema Plus Podcast, brought to you by moremovies.co.uk. I'm David Roberts, and today I'm joined by my friend and colleague Greg Fisher as we deep dive into one of our all-time favourite films, Inception, the science fiction action blockbuster directed by Christopher Nolan in 2010. A smart, innovative and thrilling film, Inception became a rare summer blockbuster, one that succeeded not only in its visual representation, but intellectually as well. The plot follows Cobb, a skilled thief who commits corporate espionage by infiltrating the subconscious of his targets. He is offered a chance to regain his old life as payment for a task considered to be impossible, inception, the implantation of another person's idea into a target subconscious. Praised by critics and audiences alike, the film was nominated and won numerous awards, particularly for its technical prowess, and made a staggering $829 million at the box office. Considered a modern classic, this month we are celebrating its 10th anniversary of its release. Before we start, here's a clip of director Christopher Nolan talking about the film. I've always been fascinated by the the nature of dreaming, the, the idea that while we're dreaming we can create a world, but perceive it at the same time without realising that we're performing both those, those functions. To the extent where, if we dream we're having a conversation with somebody, we're dreaming that person. We're also creating the words that are in that person's mouth, but we feel we're hearing them as if for the first time. It took me a long time to write the script because I based it on this idea of a heist movie set in the world of dreams. The problem with a heist movie is they tend to be procedural, they tend to be deliberately superficial. And so it took me a long time to realize that when you're dealing with the world of dreams, that's not enough, you need emotion. And so the central character played by Leonardo DiCaprio became the most important part of making the story relatable for the audience. So, 10 years after its release, Greg, what do you think of Inception? Still amazing. Can't believe it's been 10 years. Where has that time gone? It's flown by quick, hasn't it? Really quick. It seems like such a modern release, such a modern piece of cinema, a, a, a film that certainly has that stamp of, you know, post-2000 all over it. So much so, it feels like it was just made, you know, a couple of years ago. And when you say it like that, 10 years, they're doing the uh, 10-year release, it's it's crazy. It is. It's crazy because for a film about time, it is such a timeless film and um, it does feel so new. And I I think we'll be saying the same thing in 30 years. I think we'll be going, yeah, this feels just as fresh as the day it comes out. I hope so. I think so. I think it's one of them. It just is so original. It's so unique. It's so different. Um, and it's put together with such love and care that it will sit there as a time capsule for for that moment, you know, in terms of this is a great film. Certainly the jewel in Nolan's crown, so to speak, uh, for me. Tenet is looking strong. Tenet is looking like it's going to go into a similar kind of vibe, even though it's going to do something different, but that kind of vibe where it's quite original, it's from... Nolan's own mind, it's his own project of this uh, ex- exploration of our um, the way that we experience time and uh, I think so far Inception is, is his standout piece as far as I'm concerned Yeah, I, I'd agree, I think I'm a huge Christopher Nolan fan and uh, I love all his films I think they're all absolutely brilliant and yeah. they're all unique and fascinating but this is head and shoulders above the rest. This is landmark cinema, really. Well, I because... put it up there. I mean, I, I love I love the Dark Knight trilogy, but it's, you know... It's beyond what's what achieved there, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's beyond what was achieved there. And I think all of his films are absolutely amazing to me, all really great. I love them all for different reasons and in different ways. But I think Inception stands alone as this film that it doesn't come from a franchise or a property. It's not based on some true story. It's a completely new, unique idea and story. 
and you get a blockbuster film that is about complicated ideas, it's about complicated stories, it's a real intelligent piece of cinema, but with the budget of a, a blockbuster summer movie, you know. Well, it's like an art movie, an art house movie, the kind of film you'd watch, like something like The Colour of Pomegranates, and you'd watch it and you'd say, what the hell am I watching? What the hell did I just see? What the hell is this? You know, all these kind of things. And uh, he's basically took that kind of notion or that aesthetic in a film and he's put it on top of a espionage James Bond thriller, basically. It's like a, you know, espionage movie, but with all these deep, meaningful ideas where you can you can drop into different levels of dreaming and that makes anything possible. And and what he's done is is very clever because it's all quite tangible and quite believable in the sense that, you know, even when the, the city is folding back on itself and, and the experience in all these buildings going over their head and it's almost like something out of a surrealist artwork, um, it's still in a sense believable yeah and i I think you know it's a film about time and um and dreams and and these are kind of aspects that nolan always touches upon in his films he always likes to play with these unknown elements and uh you know things like memento what i mean um, is though he he does it in a realistic way like there's no dragons there's no magic wands there's no there's not, you know, there's nothing like that. Like he did with Batman, he did it in a very realistic sense. Well, I even know Inception is about things that, you know, are in in the in the waking world are completely impossible. The way he presents them in the film is still, it's still done in such a way that it's not it doesn't you don't have to suspend your disbelief too far because it's like wow, yeah. I, I think that's it, it and I know. think that's kind of an element of his cinema he always likes to although he's got these huge ideas he's presented on screen which are complicated from a plot perspective they're grounded in this reality that is his cinema is you be, you can believe it and buy into it because he presents them in such a way and i think that was you know you look at the dark knight trilogy that's the success of those films that yeah okay it's superheroes and stuff like that but because it's grounded in this reality because it's presented as a gritty crime film you can relate to it, you can understand it, you can believe it, and that's why well, with it's Batman, so much more beloved. With Batman, it's like already so unbelievable, just the concept on its, on, on its own. Some, you know, rich orphan trains himself to be a ninja and then dresses up like a bat and takes on crime. It's that Just that idea in itself is so far-fetched, so beyond yeah. reality that you don't need, in a sense, he do, he's, he's a guy that's he's all about economy. He doesn't like to um, go larger than life in, in, well, in some ways, I guess he does, but he always does it in a, in a, in a way that's very believable. So, you know, like I say, Batman's already a far-fetched enough idea, so he grounds it with as much reality as possible, and nobody's got superpowers, you know, it's they do super things, but it's kind of explained away in a sort of, you know, as you know, in a way that's believable. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. It's he has a real knack of making complex and big ideas, complex and special things that that you can present in cinema. Cinema is allowing you to do these things because it's not real life, yeah. but present them in a way that you totally buy into. It it feels real. Okay you kind of you can put those things to a side that are just a little far because everything else is grabbed towards I could believe there was mobsters down the street or whatever it happens to be. So he's able to, to, to yeah, to ground it in that in that kind of sea of believability. And I think that is the key of his films. Well the thing with this film, with Inception is even the device they use to all patch into one another's dr- dreams it's ne- the science of it is never explained to any degree, but it's presented to you in such a way that they all sort of you know they all sort of plug into it in a sense. Then it's like this intravenous drip they just sort of put in their arm and then they're out and but they're all in, and and you don't need to know the science behind it. 
and you just accept it. It's in a suitcase. They pop this sort of travel case open. There it is. It's got, you know, shiny bits on it. Nothing too ostentatious. A couple of lines come out. Everybody's in a deck chair. Bang. We're in, we're in the next sequence, which is a dream level. It's quite ingenious in a way. Yeah, and I think I think that's one of the things that it doesn't over explain concepts. He doesn't offer too much exposition. He doesn't mansplain too much. Yeah, it doesn't mansplain. It, it, it's it doesn't give all the need, needless kind of, and that's what I think a lot of films often end up in that um, trying to give too much exposition and explanation for everything that's happening. Sure. And some people won't. Some people won't like it. Sure. Some people will be like, "Oh, it doesn't make sense." But sure. Some people like me, a little uh, bit of uh, science behind it, don't they? But they do. But I, like to me, it's like just get into it. Just get straight into the heart of the matter, and get going on this tale because it's like it takes place in a period of time. We're not literally going from A to B. We're just dropped in the middle of the the story. We're, we don't. We're going through the different alphabets. <laughs> <laughs> we're going through it, and. Um, I, I think he is very skilled at, at pulling that off. Now, in terms of the kind of complicated uh, layers of the film, because it's one one criticism that many give to the film, is it's perhaps too complicated for some people to get to grips with. I, I know a few people who haven't really enjoyed it because they've got lost or confused. Do you think those are legitimate kind of criticisms that some this particular film? Is yeah, I for, think for some you know, audiences. it's legitimate in the sense that I've I would have to watch it a couple of times to get every every little nuance out of it, and even then probably miss some. But it it it, it is so textured. It's like uh you know this one of these amazing cakes that has you know fifteen layers or something. It really is intricate. So for those that went just expecting to see Leonardo DiCaprio in this kind of James Bond film that's about dreams or something, you know, if it was explained to someone as simply as that, then, yeah, I think, you know, for some people it might be a little bit confusing. But at the same time, I think it works overall as a kind of, you know, when you wake up from a dream and you you can remember it for the first five minutes and soon fades. And if you asked yourself a couple of hours later after breakfast what you were dreaming, you just can't remember. Unless you've wrote it down, you don't know what the hell you were. But at the time it was so... And it kind of can work in that way. Like I said, it's kind of like an art film in that sense that if you if you had an open mind and let yourself go, and by the time you got to the end, you know it's the kind of ending where you say, "Hmm," you know, it's an ambiguous ending anyway. So you know, it's not like. And when we were talking about it before, you made the point about it being impossible for uh, to spoil for anyone. Yeah, I think I think I think that's one of the points uh, that I I love to make about it. That it's a really interesting film. It's one of the only films I can think of that it, it is pretty much impossible to spoil because you could tell the ending to someone if they hadn't seen it and they wouldn't know what the hell you were talking about. And and that's really interesting, really, because there's plenty of films out there you you tell the the ending to someone that's it the the game's up um you you've spoiled the entire thing. Um, Especially those films that have those kind of twist endings, you know. Once you know yeah. the twists, the kind of plot is spoiled. But this is one of those films that has so many deep layers and textures throughout the film, and where it starts to where it ends up is miles apart. That I don't think it's really spoilable, because even now, half I've probably watched it a dozen times. You're never really quite sure, and that's really the point. You know that, that is the point. I don't want to know. You know, when I see it and and that uh, spinning top is still going, will it fall? And he's not dreaming, or will it keep going? And he's dreaming, and then it cuts. You, that's the whole point. You're not. You're not really. It's not the important part. The important part is Cobb made it home. You know, that's that's kind of what I got from it anyway. You know, um, I mean, I love that idea of that spinning top that they all had a. Uh, what do they call it? Like a token or a totem, that um, totem, yeah, that uh, nobody else was allowed to know about because that's their only link back to the real world. I really like that idea. Again, that's the kind of he's bringing in that human element, our uh, propensity for these kind of you know tactile things 
to keep us grounded, you know, a memory or, or a feeling of something, a weight of something or how, how it felt in your hand. I, like, I love this idea of that. And so I suppose the interesting question, what do you think it means? What the film as a whole, like a, a, the subtext of it all? Yeah. Mm, it's an interesting question. Uh, I'd have to think about that. I mean, on, on a deep philosophical level, we're talking about um, it's kind of like man plays God in the sense that trying to master time, trying to be in command of your world around you, build the world around you, uh, all these material things and live into a thousand years old. It's like the film is saying all of these things are not the point to life. The point to life is is love and, and family and closeness and relationships to others because these are the things that you value most when you are um, in this, you know, in experience in life because when he's put in that position you know that he's kept away from all of those things that's the only thing he desires even though he has the ability to create worlds live in these worlds for hundreds of years uh t- because time moves a lot slower in the dream world you know so and one night's sleep could be 10 10 weeks or something like that or whatever but uh, you know, you could give yourself anything like Saito with his huge palace of uh, his pagoda of gold and riches. You could have all these things, but and and live to be a great great old age, like I've said. But that that's not what brings you happiness. I think that's as much as I could drum up without really pulling it apart and trying to get through all those sort of Freudian levels of dream state and stuff. God knows what's in there. You could you could probably break down each dream and. And do an analysis of that because it's probably yeah. in there. Knowing Nolan, it's in there. I think, like I've always seen it as kind of like, like the dreams. They're almost like memories of life, you know. And it's I've always seen it as kind of this this journey that he's going on, and like the boxes are almost like postcards from a time in it in life, and like we would interpret memories, and we do when we we dream, you know, that's our memories and kind of saying that they're important in life to have these kind of snapshots of life but as you say the important thing throughout the whole thread of the film is this relation the relationship between the characters and the relationship really between him and his wife and that the memories are the most important things and his children as well of course his and his kids yeah um i mean there's there's this side of it where you could say that the whole i the whole conception of inception is about um planting an idea or a memory as you say in someone's subconscious so that they so you know so deep that they they it feels organic like they they remember it themselves and there is this is the whole thing about the ambiguous ending because when you get in dreams you get these you know like this the, what they call the kick when they play Edith Piaf in the real world they hear it coming through in the dream and it's kind of echoey and in the background but it's there and there's this kind of crossover of real world and dreams or, or of two dreams together and maybe the idea of planting a memory or or an idea in someone's mind is actually what is happening to Cobb all the way along and we just we just didn't realize it because we think he's planting the memory in Fisher's mind and being hired by etc. But really, it's they're planting this memory inside his mind. Who knows? It's, it kind of gets yeah. to that. It gets that deep, doesn't it? I mean, for a, for a mainstream film, for a Hollywood release, it is quite a deep film. It's deep on a lot of levels. Yeah, I it's think deep it's... Just, in, just, just the plot is deep in the sense of all the layers, but um, it's also philosophically very deep. That's it. I think it goes into far more places than the most uh, mainstream films will go, particularly kind of, you know, this was a summer blockbuster, you know, kind of. On first viewing, it's like a some kind of heist film, it, you know. Exactly. And, it and does like work that. on that level, I think, as well. It works on that level as an action movie. Yeah. But obviously, for anyone wanting to get more out of it there's far more there to get um Mm -hmm. i do think there's this kind of element of um i was speaking to someone watching it and and they kind of you could tell they weren't really paying attention to it and um they didn't enjoy it as much 
Um, and I think there's an element of if you're not really concentrating, you can really quickly get lost in the film. I think, and not I know think where the it's same, going. same with any film, any any decent film. If you take your eyes off it or you're just not that interested, you're just not going to get anything out of it. I mean, this is the thing about a film. It's supposed to be an experience where you do concentrate on it. And that's that's what's to be said for going to a, a movie theatre as well because you're paying to go in for one, so you, you've got your... You know, you're vested in that sense. You're there to be entertained in a sense. It is a theatre. And, you know, throughout the performance, throughout the film, you're not going to be playing with your phone or going to the kitchen or, or answering the phone or, you know, being distracted anyway. You're there to see the film and concentrate on it. And so I'd say that about any film. But certainly with, with a film like Inception that's got a lot going on in it, yes, uh, it's going to be, you're going to get lost easily. Because the same people are turning up in different places, doing different things at the same time, at a different time, and it's like, whoa. But I think it's interesting because it kind of, the film, in a sense, in that way, is the plot. It, it is a maze that we're going through as a viewer, um, the same way that they're going through this kind of maze, this labyrinth, and they, they keep going down and, and down and, and turning corners very, very quickly, plot-wise. Um and you as a viewer are in that, and if you kind of switch off at all, really, you may just not understand where you are and get lost. It's got a pretty get, good. Yeah. It's got a pretty good pace. Uh, when you when you first start off, you're quite you're already halfway through something. You don't know what, but he's washed up on the beach. He's got a gun on him, and he's been taken by some guards, armed guards, you know. And then you're straight in. You're straight into something. And it's like, wow, what is this? Straight away, it's asking you to start figuring things out for yourself. And anybody who enjoys a film where you have to do that, this is this is why we enjoy it so much. That you know, it's just just it's it's a great, in a sense, it's a great mystery film because you're trying to figure out what's real and what's what's not. That's the big mystery: are we awake or are we are we asleep? Are we asleep or are we awake? Well, that's the interesting thing because you know some people have kind of said that almost the film's like a metaphor for filmmaking. Yeah, it's a metaphor for cinema, um, yeah, and that an kind of brings the allegory of: Are you in a dream or is it a film? Kind of thing, and they do kind of interact in that way of when you look at it, kind of in that sense of it is a bit patchwork, um, but that's like the filmmaking process. It's these kind several of several people have to share the dream. Snippets. It's a collaborative yeah. effort. Yeah, I can see it, and I'm sure that's in there as well. Because the good thing is with these things, there's not really any right or wrong. It's just about the expansive conversation, and it can work on on several levels and mean entirely different things at the same time. You know, um, as all good films yeah, I think do. As all, yeah, as all good films do, and I think this is one of those, it's got so much packed into it that it's one of them I think will be debated for a very long time about all its different... Of all, uh, of all his films, of, of all his films, apart from, of course, with the exception of the Dark Knight trilogy, of all his films, it's the one that it could that you, you could do a sequel. It kind of spoiled the first one, if you did, maybe, but just that idea maybe with different characters that all go into dreams as well but there's definitely scope there for doing something else with it i think yeah there is scope but i think you're right in in terms of maybe would spoil it and um i think looking at nolan as a director you probably wouldn't it's because uh, no, oh, i don't from the, think so either but all know, i'm saying is Nights, as far as the material goes it's the one that's got the potential to you know, to squeeze some more uh, stories out of. Basically, I don't. Not saying that I think they should, because it works so well as a standalone film. And you know, all the greatest films really are the ones that there's just one of them, and it is just, just one of them. Yeah, one story, and and yeah, I'd put it up there. What about the cast then? You like you liking the cast? This one? Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan. Of Leonardo DiCaprio, I don't think he's done a bad film. Um, I love everything he's in. Um, probably with the only exception really being Titanic, but that's not. It's he's still, uh, you know, it's still a good film in a way. It's just not my cup of tea, uh, and his performance is still good in it. But 
So, uh, but anything that he's in, I I love, and he's particularly brilliant in this film, I think. And he's you know joined by a star-studded cast with him, you know. Yeah, they're all in there. You got uh, jo- Joseph Gordon-Levitt, of course, and Ellen Page are probably the closest, and Tom Hardy make up the team. You got uh, the great Ken Watanabe playing Saito. He's always good. Uh, he was in the Batman, the first Batman film, I think, as well. He played uh, that. Raz al Ghul sort of character. Yeah. Before you find out it's Liam Neeson, it's Ken Watanabe. Killian Murphy, of course, played Scarecrow in The Dark Knight. He likes working with him. I like seeing Tom Berenger in there as the uncle. I mean, yeah. he, he turned up also in uh, Batman Dark Knight Rises, but, you know, it's great to see him still working. And and, um, and then, of course, you've got the old boys, Pete Postlethwaite, Michael Caine. One of, one of Pete Postlethwaite's last performances, I think. Yeah, I think he did uh, one movie after it, but yeah, it was one of his last um, last films he did. Yeah, and uh, how could I go through the the cast there without mentioning the always amazing Marianne Cotillard? A wonderful, brilliant performance. Friend. Oh, she is. That's that's a for me. It's a Hitchcockian performance. It's kind of like whoa, she is scary. She's genuinely scary. Yeah, but, uh, powerful. On the screen, and 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 yeah, that Hitchcockian kind of look about her that kind of transfixes you, you you, yeah. you know, and uh, doesn't pull any punches. Just that thing as well when they're out, you know, when they're out on the ledge, and uh, you know when you find out what's happened later on in the film, you know, spoiler alert, but uh, she's on the ledge and and you know she 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 believes she's dreaming, and if she jumps off, she'll wake up, and it, and he's. He's trying to convince her that she's not. She's actually awake, and that's a quite a shocking scene when you first watch it. I, I was, you know, I was quite shocked. Yeah, his, it's, his, it's, his, act, his acting's brilliant there. You know, he goes to pieces, and it's just like you would. It was just what a horrific thing to witness. And it's that kind of, it's that interesting uh, kind of emotional pull because you, as a viewer, don't really know uh, the reality of the situation because often something like that is portrayed in a film. And you kind of you know that they're in a dream or whatever it happens to be, so you kind of know what the consequence of the action would be, and the emotion is that I oh, don't do it because we know as an audience member. But in this situation, we actually don't know. We don't, we don't really know what's going on, and it could be either way. And so it's even more kind of oh my, you know, the suspense mm-hmm. of the whole thing. Yeah, it does sort of like I say, it reminded me of Hitchcock that the tuxedo with the window ledge. The, the curtains flapping out, out of the window, her just beside herself and and ready to do it. It's It was t- intense, suspenseful, really great filmmaking. Stunning filmmaking. I think my favourite scene uh, is, you know, a lot, a lot of people like it, but I, I love the, the fight in the corridor with Joseph Gordon-Levitt um, fighting the agents. I think that is the sequence for me that just transfixes me in terms of how amazing it's pulled off um shot on a huge gimbal inside uh shot on a gimbal done for real studio uh with yeah. real stunt men it's you'd have just you'd have to do that thing. you'd have to do that for for real well you could do it cgi but it just wouldn't look as good as that it's no, almost it like it almost things. it almost looks that good that it was like they flew a you know, one of those planes up to the edge of space like they do when they filmed, uh, you know, Apollo 13 and stuff where they're actually weightless. It almost looks that good. It's it's it's, it's yeah, quite an just, incredible piece of filmmaking there. It's an amazing execution of, of something, you know, like that. And I think it's one of them things that... It's one of the reasons I, I admire uh, Nolan so much because he is such a kind of naturalist in his cinema and he likes to... What he shoots on the film because he still shoots on film he likes to be what is in the film of course he has to do some special effects work but as much as possible is done for real that you get this real real naturalism in the film you get this realism which we talked about earlier um, but everything you see generally speaking is is done for real so the physics of it and the, the kind of natural elements and the kind of things that would go wrong are, are there to see. And that makes you believe in it more. And it makes it so much more stunning than some shiny 
you know CGI model flying across the screen or something which you know even to this day okay it's got a lot better than it has in the past but you can still tell you know um, and for things like that yeah I don't think it would work well uh, funnily enough um, on Twitter the other day we looked at uh, an article that said uh, Nolan said that the VFX shot count in Tenet was probably lower than most romantic comedies. That's how uh, how much you know he's he's tried to stick to that with this latest movie coming out. Yeah, and something like on, less than three hundred. Yeah, yeah, less than three hundred VFX shots. Brilliant. That was on our uh, we we. Um, retweeted that on our twitter page which is at more movies four just like to uh, do a shout out as well to skip bolden and to tico romeo and to liam jackson thanks guys for all your comments and retweets and support uh we love the post that you're putting out at the moment as well so it's great that we're all just uh in this f- uh film festival on twitter there sharing each other's ideas and you know i'm learning all- every day about more movies it's, it's really cool yeah, it is. It is great to see everyone on there, just kind of commenting and sharing the, the stuff with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's interesting because I mean, you, you say you know, it, it's you look at Tenet, and that, obviously that's coming up, and we're very excited for that. And, and it is, it is kind of baffling to see because we've obviously seen the trailer, and there's lots of explosions and reverse shots and cars flying everywhere and all this. But you know, less than like I say, special in, a, in a sense, it's it's another Inception movie, but it's. You know, do you think there'll be, a, you know, in the future, a collection or, or a trilogy of, you know, they'll call it the Nolan Time Trilogy or something, you'll have Inception, Tenet, and maybe there'll be another one. And it, it you know, even though they're they're not the same characters or the same storylines, but they, they may be very similar in theme and originality to be considered. Um yeah. Maybe maybe someone will loosely call call free films that I, I'm not sure if it'll be approached officially that way. Um, because these in, things in never reality, are though. These things never are. For example, we were no, talking no. about the uh, the uh, Alan J. Pacula, the um, political paranoia trilogy, and I don't think he ever set out to make a official political paranoia trilogy. But that's what people call them further down the line. And I'm just trying to get at that with with Nolan with these kind of films. I think there will be this kind of you know, possibly there's, there's the Batman trilogy there's the you know the only thing is with him that um, I think all of his films are influenced by time and uh, and these kind of elements I think if you obviously and in well, different ways but I suppose you're right because I was I was going to say what about Dunkirk but that that again does um, look at time because you've got it over one day over one you know one hour, sorry, isn't it? And then over a day, and then over a week or something. Over a like week, that. And it's, yeah. It's all and it's all shot out of, uh, all edited out of order, um, yeah. and it's only the only real way of telling the story. But it, it's brilliantly executed. You got Memento, of course, which is all, of course, yeah, out I mean, of that. order. Uh, um, there was what was the one um, about magic? Uh, the the Prestige. The Prestige. Well, I'd have to watch that again, but I dare say there's there's some elements there. The, yeah, there's the, elements of time in that. Um, Interstellar, of course, is talking about uh, time um, differentials. Interstellar different basically planets. is, uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, who's listening, is basically a, a cheap remake of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey. So see that How before you see dare you say. Nolan's uh, <laughs> Interstellar, which is fine. I, I went to see it, I enjoyed it, but it, it lifted so heavily from... Not just the look and the concepts, but you know that he does love Kubrick. I mean, talk about doing things like that big gimbal for the corridor shot in Inception. That's exactly the school of Stanley Kubrick. Let's build a huge gimbal. Let's invent a oh, lens yeah. and let's do it our own way. You know, and 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 fair dues to Nolan. It's great that he's got someone like him as his uh, as such a heavy influence. But for me, Interstellar, as great a film as it is, it was just that one. Because I'm so used to him being original. I mean, like you said, Inception is so original. It's so unique. It's not. It's not like anyone else's films. I mean, the only thing you could say is it's, it's got slight 
espionage film elements or tropes to it, but only very few. You know, there's, it's not like it's copying James Bond or anything, really. It's just an aesthetic there. But the film itself is so original, whereas I felt a little bit disappointed with Interstellar in the sense that it did borrow so heavily from 2001. I'm surprised there wasn't um, a monolith I, in it, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think... I mean, I think visually it is very 2001 and uh, there's all those elements, but... I, I don't think I think story wise it goes in a different direction myself. Um You're not far it's, off uh, him going into a black hole towards the end of that film. Only well, in Nolan's version it's like a Disney film where he floats in this magic book, <laughs> bookcase and he just says to his daughter, I'm here, I can see you and it's just like, you know, in, in two thousand one the guy the guy went to a crazy fucking room in his own mind where he was simultaneously a newborn baby and an old man <laughs> it was you know, <laughs> hanging out with the monolith, you know, that was that was a movie. Matthew McConaughey Kind of, hey, floating around in your bookcase. That's just that's just wrong. That's what I want every evening. Um. <laughs> <laughs> he is a great actor. I love McConaughey. Have I you ever seen um, Have you ever seen True De- True Detective series one yet? I have. Yeah. Um, well, not all of it, but I've seen a few episodes of it. Um, incredible what I've seen of it so far. I mean, there you go. Could he have played Cobb just as well as DiCaprio in Inception? What do you reckon? No, not as well as the Cappers. No, I, I think it's a different performance. Uh, it required. would be different, but would he play it his own? All right, all right, all right, McConaughey way. You know, <laughs> could he do it? I, I, I don't think know. He could. I think not to say that he couldn't. Um, you know, do a do a really interesting take on it, maybe. That, but it, but it would be a really different film. I think. I don't think he could. All right, then, how about what, DiCaprio playing his role in Interstellar? Could you imagine that? Um, again, no. Exactly. No no chance yeah. DiCaprio could do that role. Imagine him but, floating you know, behind the bookshelf <laughs> with the spacesuit on. Just He'd just come out with Wolf of Wall Street, wouldn't he? Uh, out of the bookcase. <laughs> yeah. But the, I, and they were I, both I in that a, scene in Wolf of Wall Street as well. Funnily enough, yeah. Bum, bum, da, dum. yeah. But I think that's the whole thing with casting, isn't it? I think you look at something like that and you kind of go, "It's interesting that, however great these actors are, you know, and I love them both. It is certain roles work and certain roles just just wouldn't at all, you know. Mm. And and that's what it comes down to, you know. Imagine I don't know Leonardo DiCaprio playing Batman." Instead of Christian Bale, that that now we're work. getting into territory where like George Clooney played Batman. You know, this is kind of yeah. you love George Clooney. He's a fantastic actor, but put him in the bat suit at that stage, what the hell? That's it. It, it was, was it was wrong. great, but it was it was almost getting back to the Adam West style style of Batman, where it was just you know completely hammed up. I, 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 I'm a fan of Batman and Robin, by the way. I, I, I like it. I, you know, I, I, I can, hate it. <laughs> I can, I can look back and say, what a good laugh that is. Uh, it's got good points to it. Schwarzenegger is hilarious as Mr. Freeze. Ice to see you, and um, uh, of course, Elisa Silverstone. Always good to see her in the, as Batgirl. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. I think it's horrific. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. Um, but, you know, I, I like those sort of uh, cheesy, kind of um, camped up, colourful films of, of the 80s and 90s. You know, uh, something like Flash Gordon, which they've just done a 4K co- uh, conversion of and they put it back in the theatres, apparently. I'd go and see it. That's now that's a film. It is yeah. a terrible film, but god damn it, I love it. It's brilliant. Yeah, I'd probably go and see that. Uh, just almost ironically, I guess. <laughs> it's uh, so that brings us around fun. to the point will you go and see Inception when they release it on the 21st for the 10 year anniversary? Will you go and see it? If I can, and I will. Um, did you see it when it came out? I did. I saw it um twice in one week. Yeah, <laughs> um, I went to see it. I was quite. 
I'm quite lucky. I, di- I didn't get to see it in IMAX, unfortunately, or anything like that. Um, did you so go? Did if- you go and see it again just because you were like, "Whoa, I need to see that again" because there's there's so much in there. Yeah, um, I went and saw it with one friend, and then like a couple of days later, I was like, "Do you want to go watch it?" Uh, I went to my brother or something, and then we were like, "Yeah, let's go watch it." So um, I was well. I mean, it's the Sign same thing. I watched film. the Dark. Yeah, the same thing with the Dark Knight. I watched that three times in in the space of about a week and a half. So when they're good, I, I go back and watch them, and uh, I, well, try to anyway. Well, uh, I usually I, do that with with the big films. I did it with uh, I did it with the Star Wars films, apart from the last one. The last one um, I didn't go and see twice. I just had enough. No, I was then. too busy. But I was too I, busy vomiting in a bin after that. Yeah, I was too busy blowing my own brains out after that. But, <laughs> um, sorry, JJ, but you suck. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I did see Inception first time round in the, in the theater. It is it is a great cinema movie because you got so much going on. Like I said, that that scene where he's taking uh, Ellen Page, Ariadne to a, uh, you know, show with the ropes and all the, the all the buildings. It looks like Paris or something, and it's like they're all Folds folding back, itself, folding yeah. back over on themselves. And you watch that in the cinema, and it's like, wow, wow, it's amazing. Think, it's amazing. It's like um, I think it's interesting. It's because it, it, I think that's. The thing with Nolan's films, really, they are films to watch in the cinema. They are beautiful-looking films, you know, often working with Wally Fister, a cinematographer, um, for a long time, and they are it's, I believe it's, real it's, pieces it's of art. Wally P. Fister? Wally P. Fister. I believe that's <laughs> how you say it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, we... They're films to go and watch on the big screen, really. Um, they're great, obviously, on, on smaller screens, but if you get chances, they they're are great films on to your phone. They're great on the big screen. They're great in a drive through. They're great if you're just standing outside a Radio Reynolds watching through the window. They're great, whichever way you slice <laughs> on, it. On a black and white telly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 10 years. Can't believe it. Feels like yesterday or tomorrow, whichever one it is. I can't remember. So, 10 years on, you've probably watched it a dozen times since, I, I imagine. I've watched it um, a few times. I've watched, I'm not sure a dozen, but I've probably watched it five times. I watched it earlier this year. I uh, forced our, our friend and colleague, Lyndon, to watch it. He'd never seen it, and he loved it. So I, I, I can imagine he would love it. Definitely up his street. I think it's uh, on Netflix in the UK at the moment. You can watch it on there. It is. It's just come on to Netflix. I might go watch it again in a bit. So if you can't um, get down to the cinema because you're shielding or you're still uh, staying safe at home, just like me, um, then you can watch it on Netflix. That's it. The new world. Digital streaming. Yeah. So uh, after all these years, out of 10, what do you think it is? Out of 10? Yeah. Oh, it's it's a strong 8. Let's see what I gave it a... Oh, I give it a 9 on the uh, IMDb. So there you go. That's high praise indeed for me because hardly anything gets a 10, of course, but... Only the very best films get a nine, um, and it's got eight point eight average on IMDb. So that's it's, it's it's well thought of. What about you? Would you give it? Uh, it's a ten for me. The big ten. Wow. Big ten. Which is it's in my very rare kind of category of tens. You know, uh, it joins the great dozen really for me. Sure, hard to top a film like that. It, it ticks a lot of boxes. It ticks a lot of boxes. It's it is the it's the big blockbuster you get, you go out to see and enjoy the the latest DiCaprio big budget film. But it's also, you know, works for nerds like us breaking it down, and watching it a million times to try and you know break down all the philosophical and socio economic subtext. Just like we were back in English. Um, yeah, I think that's Just it. like it, we it, were it, back there in film studies with Rob Shale back in the day. There's a big, big hello to <laughs> our former mentor, Rob Shale. How are we doing, Rob? Um, follow him on Twitter, at Rob Shale. He's out there. Um, I think that's it. it it's, a, it's a film that is both a great, easy-to-watch, fun blockbuster, which I love, you know, 
uh, it, you know, one of those action heist movies. I love all that, and it's a really clever character piece with an intelligent plot and stuff like that, which is the other kind of film I like. So it kind of smashes my two favorite genres in, into one really great film. So it's uh, one of my top films. Yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite Hollywood films. Um, and yeah, hard to top a film like that. But you know, that's our Christopher Nolan for you. He's uh, he's a good lad. Everyone's he's a very good forward, lad. And everyone's looking forward to Tenet. Yeah, out uh, end of this month, supposedly, if it doesn't so, get rescheduled again. Well, uh, re- I, I thought it was getting sub- September, but I might have read that wrong. Um, but definitely got Inception back in selected theatres from the 21st. Um, so, yeah, be careful going out there in it, if you do, but... It's one hell of a film to see. It certainly is. Well, there we go. Ten years on. A great film. It's been Greg Fisher and David Roberts talking about Inception. Thank go watch it much. now on Netflix or catch it in the cinema later this month. And we'll catch you next time. Catch you movies. next time. So there we are. That's it for this episode in our favourite films collection. It's been David Roberts talking with Greg Fisher. I hope you can join us again for another Cinema Plus podcast. In the meantime, be sure to hit us up on moremovies.co.uk and come and say hello to us on Twitter or Facebook. Thanks for listening, and that's a wrap.